Merit is the goal for, for this stream and for Pat McAfee's show. And Merit can just be fun and entertaining. entertaining. That, that's meritorious to give people something that makes them feel good. And so a, a more free conversation will come at a cost as opposed to a more stilted conversation, right? A, a conversation that strictly follows journalistic protocol. There's a cost to that too, right? It will be incredibly constipated compared to a free-flowing conversation. So it's not as though you can just choose one type of conversational style, one type of approach to a live stream, one type of approach to a radio show, and, and that's just the best approach, and there are no downsides to it, right? There's a downside to have a free, open conversation, and there's a downside to having you know, a very strictly monitored, only journalistic protocol conversation, right? You can listen to NPR, if you don't like Pat McAfee. McAfee to denounce his friends should have known better by then. I've never listened to Pat McAfee. I've never had any interest in listening to Pat McAfee. Right? He seems to produce the kind of low IQ shows that uh, don't intrigue me. On all the smoke, after the Kimmel smear but before the Sandy Hook nonsense, McAfee shared that he'd lost sleep over his role in the Rogers saga, saying, maybe I am fucking this up completely. But he also offered a novel defense. Yeah, you want to be a powerful live streamer? Right, look to Destiny. He doesn't just share information. He doesn't just share what he's thinking and feeling, but he shares what he's thinking and feeling at the time. He's incredibly open. And so to be an effective uh, radio host, uh, talk radio host, or a live streamer, or a podcaster, you have to be willing to share all sorts of you know, vulnerable things. And that's what Pat McAfee does, right? That is the price for connecting with an audience is that you share things that normally people would keep to themselves, right? So you can share something publicly that's very sensitive to you. And that doesn't mean that everyone should just be entitled to bring it up publicly and uh, castigate you for it, right? It's still a sensitive thing, right? When people share sensitive things publicly, it doesn't cease to be sensitive, right? You don't then have an all access pass to, you know, mock or belittle someone for sharing something they've struggled over or something they've regretted. Which is that his relationship with Rogers had enabled him to tease out a more honest and complete portrait of a historic figure in sports. Whenever there's documentaries made about Aaron Rodgers, they are going to use so much of our show, he said. Is that not journalism? No, it is not. Right, it's not journalism, but it certainly can contribute to journalism. Journalism requires an active pursuit of the truth. And you really think this author would pursue an active pursuit of the truth if doing so would get him banned from all the outlets that uh, he likes to publish in, that he would lose his social circle, that he would become incredibly isolated, that his family would turn against him, that it would place him in poverty and he'd have to get a job you know, selling athletic shoes. But I don't think uh, this journalist would be willing to pursue the truth. I don't think most journalists would be willing to pursue the truth. They're willing to pursue the truths that are socially acceptable in their profession. Stepping on a rake. He's not completely wrong, though. We can debate forever the ethics of platforming public figures who say odious things. But it's also true that Rogers used to be considered among the more thoughtful, intellectually curious stars in the NFL. And now, thanks in no small measure to the Pat McAfee show, we've heard enough of his self-satisfied, moronic bloviating to know better. This sheds light on the controversy over the lab leak theory from very charitable ago. view of the research happening in that lab. So I, I don't believe that they were intentionally trying to make pandemic pathogens. They, they tried to do their work in very weak viruses, but I think by accident, they might have put in a pandemic feature that made one of these weak viruses capable of starting a human pandemic. And the issue here is that they were doing a lot of this work in the years leading up to the pandemic at a very low biosafety level. So you had asked Bob Gary, uh, was it appropriate for them to do this type of research at BSL2. And, and Bob said he thought it was a high enough level of biosafety. That is just not true. So you cannot be working with novel SARS-like viruses at BSL2. If you do this for several years and you're working with hundreds of these SARS-like viruses, one day you're going to get unlucky. <laughs> mm, right. So what, what about his point? He was saying all the cases originated around the um, Hunan market and that that in that market, they found traces of the coronavirus in this particular like section where the animals were kept. There, there are a few facts that need to be pointed out about this market. So the first thing is that this market is the size of about 10 NFL stadiums. 
Okay, 10. Okay, so she's a molecular biologist. All right, she's not a virologist. NFL stadiums, the retail space in that market. And it's located in one of the most densely populated districts in, in Wuhan City, where most of the elderly people live. It's located right next to the Wuhan CDC and several hospitals, key hospitals in that city. It's also located next to the most highly trafficked metro train station in that city. Oh, great line here from Brandon Smith. It's ironic how the COVID pandemic is just another unwanted government program. Good point. <laughs> so by the time the investigators went there, the entire market, 10 NFL stadiums, had been plastered with virus. So <laughs> they, Bob Gary says that he, he thinks that based on the available data, which is very little, he thinks that the, the there's evidence of contamination near the wildlife stores. But if you look at it closely, actually the, the washrooms and the, to <laughs> the toilets in that market are, are right there. So uh, he... He and his collaborators on this peer-reviewed peer science paper where he's pointing to actually admit in the paper itself, we, hey, we don't have the data, but we're going to make a bunch of assumptions that support our belief that this came from the market, and we're going to tell everyone that we've, we've found the animal at this market. Those studies cannot stand if, if they were truly opened up for open peer review by, by other scientists. What do, what do you make of his assertion? Because I said, where's the animal? Or where, where's even one? You know, they tested 80,000 and they're not there. And he said the Chinese got rid of them, you know, in an effort to cover it up, that they didn't want the news narrative to be, they came from a lab, which, you know, the, or sorry, from, uh, from the Wuhan market. So I agree that China now has a stance that we, that they don't want any any evidence at all that this virus originated in China is anywhere but cure stance. So they're, they're trying to blame it on lobsters from Maine. They're trying to blame it on cold chain from <laughs> Southeast Asia. Uh, they're trying to blame it on salmon from the Faroe Islands, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, everyone who sees that knows it's a, it's a farce, right? So Okay, so I looked at her Wikipedia entries. So Alina Chan became known during COVID for co-authoring a preprint according to which the virus was pre-adapted to humans. And she suggested that COVID-19 could have escaped from a laboratory. The preprint had not been accepted for publication by a scientific journal, but it received a significant reception in the popular press. So there's a huge popular versus expert discrepancy with regard to the lab leak hypothesis. It's incredibly exciting theme in the popular press, but the scientific establishment, particularly with regard to virologists, uh, tend not to buy it. So the reaction of virologists and other specialists to chance hypothesis has been overwhelmingly negative. New York Times noted in October 2021 that Elena Chan's view has been widely disputed by other scientists. Then she detailed her views in long Twitter postings. All right, that's not the normal way that scientists try to make a case. She wrote opinion pieces on the subject with science journalist Matt Ridley. Uh, Matt Ridley is a global warming skeptic. And so global warming is similar. There's an overwhelming consensus among the experts that there's man-made global warming that is leading us to catastrophe. On the other hand, right, their funding, their status, their prestige, their access to pretty young women, their invites to give speeches and to appear in the media depends upon them being right, that we're headed for a global catastrophe and they have the cure, they can show us how not to go there. And so if you're a scientist with a contrary perspective, on this global warming hypothesis, you're going to have an impossible time of getting funding. Because scientific funding is overwhelmingly done by groups, by bureaucracies. And how do you become an expert in global warming? Other global warming experts anoint you as an expert in global warming. How, how do you become an expert in anything? Other experts note you as an expert, but an expert is someone who knows things that regular people don't know, can't know, unless they put in an equivalent amount of, uh, of study as the expert. So expertise poses a significant challenge to democracy. And virologists want you know, maximum freedom for themselves and status and prestige and funding. And they, they don't like you know, what uh, Alina Chan is talking about. Right, so she and Matt Ridley authored a book called Viral, The Search for the Origin of, of COVID-19. Now, global warming is something so complicated that no one person can be an expert in global warming. You can only know a tiny little bit of the overall global warming hypothesis, right? You can only develop, you know, a limited amount of expertise. And so it's based on all sorts of models that uh, from, from an outside perspective seem fairly questionable. But you can't get funding if you don't buy into the global warming hypothesis.
because funding primarily comes from governments and private business. And any private business that funded you know, anti-global warming research would be castigated and you know, just dragged through the mud as people you know, intent on destroying our planet. So she published an op-ed in the New York Times yesterday, why the pandemic probably started in a lab in five key points. So here are the five key points, that the virus that caused the pandemic emerged in Wuhan, the city where the world's foremost research lab for SARS-like viruses is located. Right, this is the world's foremost lab for this type of virology study. And if the world's foremost lab for this type of virology study unleashed the pandemic, that reflects very poorly, not just on this lab, but on virologists who by and large circled the wagons to protect the reputation of the Wuhan clinic. The year before the outbreak, the Wuhan Institute, working with U.S. partners, had proposed creating viruses with the, the defining features of what became known as COVID. Right? The Wuhan lab pursued this work under low biosafety conditions, could not have contained an airborne virus as infectious as COVID. So people don't want to be regulated, generally speaking. People don't want to be intruded upon. People don't want to be investigated, and people don't want to jump through all sorts of hoops to do the things that they want to do. The hypothesis that COVID came from an animal at the Hunan seafood market in Wuhan is not supported by strong evidence. Key evidence that would be expected if the virus had emerged from the wildlife trade is still missing. Um, but what, what Bob Gary is saying is that in all of the years, even before the pandemic, the scientists who have been studying the wildlife and the bats all around that area and other parts of China have not been able to find any animals infected with SARS-2-like viruses, uh, except for pangolins far down in South China. They have not found any bats in the area that carry this type of viruses. And so he's saying that all of that evidence must have been covered up. <laughs> Either that or we have been exceedingly unlucky that suddenly a virus with this furing cleavage site just pops up, boom, and leaves no trace across the rest of China in the years leading up to or after the pandemic. So it, it requires a massive conspiracy across tons of scientists, wildlife traders, hospitals, like the government. So I, I, I think that that conspiracy is much... So remember how for years I was on my high horse that the only legitimate grounds for debate are the grounds of facts and the grounds of logic. But then I, I read a contrary perspective saying that in, in the real world we have to often make decisions as a, using a heuristic of how credible are the individuals in you know whatever matter that we're arguing about. So how credible is this woman, Alina Chen?